Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Welcome, everybody. Everybody, welcome to Living Word and Worship Ministries for our Wednesday night Bible study. We are so excited that you came to join us on tonight, and we pray that we can be a blessing to you. So before we get started with our word, I just wanted to first pray uh, as we get started on tonight. 
Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before you right now. Lord, we're thanking you, we're praising you, we're magnifying your name. We appreciate you, God, for all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you're about to do. Now, God, bless us in a mighty way. Help us, Lord, and lead us and guide us like never before. We pray, Lord, that you're opening the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings that we don't even have room enough to receive. Open the eyes of our heart, Lord, and let us receive the word that you have for us, that you shall be glorified. And I pray, Lord, that you empower us, you motivate us, you encourage us, and you push us, Father God, like never before. And so, God, we honor you, God, and we praise your holy name, and we appreciate you, Lord, for all that you're doing. We thank you, Lord, just for waking us up this morning, starting us on our way. We thank you, Lord, for protecting us, leading us, and guiding us to this moment in time, for us to be here in this place, for this moment, God, Lord, that you shall be glorified. Now, God, we just give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory in the matchless, mighty name of Jesus we pray and we all say amen and amen amen well praise God for everybody on tonight amen I'm so excited to see all of the folks that are out there uh, as we always say when we get ready to start our services that if you are connected to us all of my Facebook family please make sure that you share this on your page so other people can join and be a part with us as well so if you got different groups you're connected to different friends that you have please share this on your page so we can have as many people as possible because we believe that there is a word from the Lord and we think that anyone that tunes in on tonight is going to be blessed blessed by that word. So we give God praise for that. And so we thank you all, all the ones that have been joining us and connecting with us over the past several months of time. We appreciate you joining and connecting with us during this time. So uh, sit back and we just pray that God will be a blessing to you on tonight. So let us get right into the word on tonight and uh, let us just really just, you know, search uh, the scriptures of what God wants to say and what God wants to do. I believe that there is a word from the Lord. I believe that God is doing something supernatural. And so we're just believing God that he is going to bring revelation to us on tonight, bring revelation to us. So the title of our message tonight, the title of our message is overcoming fear, overcoming fear. Over the past several Sundays, we've been talking about how you can overcome, that you can handle this. You can deal with the pressures and the strains of life, that you can, uh, you can uh, overcome the situations that you're dealing with. But we want to talk specifically tonight about one of those things that specifically comes in to stop, to halt you, to keep you from moving forward, to keep you from getting to the place that God's called you to be. And in all reality... It is something that stops us from doing what we know we should do in order for us to get to the place that God's called us to go. So many times we see what the enemy is doing. We see things that are taking place around us that are outside of our control. Things like coronavirus, things like uh, the civil unrest of racism within our society. All those things we see taking place and happening, uh, and those things are outside of our control. Maybe it's a family member that has passed away. Maybe it's uh, you getting laid off from your job. There are so many different situations that take place in our life that we don't have control over. It wasn't a decision that we made that led us to where we were. It was just something that took place and God allowed to happen in our lives. But then on the flip side, there's other situations. On the flip side, there are things that we know that we should be doing, places that we know we should be going, things that we know we should be accomplishing, things that we know we should be starting, but yet we don't start it. Sometimes it's the fear that keeps us. It's fear that holds us back, that stops us from moving and prevents us from going to the next place that God's called us to go. Tonight, we want to deal with that fear that overtakes us in our own mind and that prevents us from moving to the place that we know we need to be in order to receive that which we say we want and we desire. All of us would probably agree that we're looking for God's blessing. We're looking for God's favor in our life. We're looking for God's purpose in our life and we're moving forward towards it. But sometimes fear stops us in our tracks. 
And we've got to deal with that. Fear is this. The dictionary definition of fear was a dissenting emotion, a dissenting emotion. So fear in itself, just with that piece right there, we recognize that fear first starts with us. Fear doesn't start with an external source. Now, there are external sources that can provoke fear. But truly fear in itself and in, in what it is and it's all of its glory starts on the inside of us. We are the originators of where fear is developed and we are also the ones that will either destroy it or promote its growth. It says fear, the definition, a dissenting emotion aroused by impeding danger, evil, or pain. Now, this is very interesting in this definition because, as it says, it's a dissenting emotion and it's aroused. So it's something that's already on the inside of us that has the capacity or the ability to manifest or to form or to grow roots in our life, but yet it is dormant until it is aroused until something takes place until something happens now fear gets sparked up in us it gets excited it gets motivated it gets jump started in our minds be based on the danger evil or pain that we recognize here's the interesting thing about the definition it goes on to say that not only is it an emotion that's aroused by the impending danger, evil or pain. It's based on whether the threat of that danger or evil or pain is real or imagined. It doesn't even matter if the situation that you're going through is a true reality. You might have the thought of something maybe happening and you could have a panic attack. You could walk into fear. Fear can be grown and manifested inside of you, not based on a reality of something that's already happened, but based on the thought that something could happen. So many times we get ourselves in situations where we get afraid and we get upset and we get down and out about stuff that hasn't even taken place yet. The enemy is so cunning in how he operates and how he prevents and keeps us from moving forward. Sometimes he just paints a picture of what something could look like in your life. And if we don't like the picture, fear can instantly come in and keep us from moving forward past the place that he has created and into the blessing that God has created. So, Fear is not necessarily just based on the reality of the situation uh, being fearful or being dangerous or being evil or us actually feeling pain. It can be a response that we have based on our thought of that pain or that danger or that evil, whether real or not. It's the feeling and condition of being afraid. I'm fearful. I'm afraid. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on, but I just feel this way. Now, the interesting thing I want to tell you tonight, so hopefully you got your pens and your pencils ready, because I want to give you something that maybe you haven't heard about before. I want to let you know that fear has an originating source on the inside of you. So based on those things that might be true or might not be true, based on that danger or that evil or that pain that we're looking at or we're attempting to avoid... Fear now starts in our minds. There is a gland in your body. I want you to look this up after this message. It's called the amygdala. That's A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A, amygdala. The amygdala is a almond-shaped mass of gray matter in the brain. Now, let me break down and explain to you exactly what the amygdala does. The amygdala is, uh, is, is the, basically the piece of your brain that when something happens in your life that seems fearful to you 
or seems evil or it's a situation where you feel like pain could come to you. The amygdala activates areas involved in the preparation for your motor functions. So what it's saying is, is that your amygdala, once it gets that, that sense that something's about to happen and fear starts to spark up in your body, your brain, the amygdala, starts to uh, heighten the senses of your nerves in your body. Because your body, your mind, as, as we all know, it's your mind that dictates everything that takes place in your body. You can't move your pinky finger if it wasn't for your mind telling you to do so. You could not speak. You could not breathe in and out if your mind is not sending signals to all of the organs in your body, all of the places in your body, dictating your body and telling your body what to do based on what's processed first where in your mind. That's why the mind is the battleground. That's why that's where the fight and the war is against the enemy. The fight and the war is not in the natural places, but it's in the mental places. Fear starts in the mind, in the amygdala, because as soon as fear comes across your eyes or your ears or your nose and your senses pick up something that seems fearful to you, it now involves and it percolates your motor functions to start to operate and do something. And it gives you the mindset of fight or flight. It tells you, well, do I need to stand here and stand my ground or do I need to turn tail and run? The amygdala is what does that. It tells your brain and it tells your body and it acts and responds. Now, here's the interesting thing. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody was around the corner and you didn't know they was around the corner and you're just walking innocently, you know, just, you know, walking innocently. And then all of a sudden you get around the corner and guess what? Somebody says, boo. And when they say boo, you jump and you become fearful. You become afraid, right? Why? Because what happened is, is as soon as they said boo, instantaneously, the amygdala that's in your brain gave all of your senses in your body a response. And the response was fear. And so based on that fear, now that signal went from your amygdala to every single nerve in your body that told you to jump backwards and take a deep breath <gasps> like this. So the amygdala instantly sends those triggers to your brain and it tells your body to now flight. I, I, I'm in this situation. It's happened so fast that it's not even about you processing it and thinking about it. Sometimes your amygdala will move so, excuse me, so quickly that when it takes place, you just respond. You don't even have time to think about it. You just respond out of your emotion because of the signals that are sent. And so these are the signals that we have to suppress. These are the signals that we have to understand. How do we control this thing that we call fear? Not only does fear release the fight or flight, it also releases stress hormones. So the amygdala processes it. And based on what's happening or based on what could happen or based on your response to what could happen, it sends out stress hormones to the rest of your body. Now, how many times have you gone to the doctor? And they said you need to minimize your stress. Stress can cause cancer. Stress can cause heart disease. Stress can cause diabetes. Stress can cause so many different things when you allow it to be released in your body, released in your mind, released in your heart based on uh, your mindset about the situation that you're in. See, that's what fear does to us. Fear instantaneously starts to operate and push things out from this gland in our body to every part of our body. And so that's why we start to have aches and pains and feel sick when we're not really sick. And it's stress because it's sending signals out constantly that are not good for your body to be feeling over and over again. And see, stress is a continuation 
Stress is not just one moment in time. Like if somebody hits you on your hand, you feel that pain just for a moment in time and then eventually it goes away. Well, when you're stressed out about something, it's something that goes on and on more than one minute to two minutes to hours to days to weeks to months. Sometimes even years people get stressed out. And they get caught up in the quicksand of stress, never being able, never able to release themselves and truly move forward in what God has really called for them. Not only does it release, we said, the fight or flight inside of you, but fear in the amygdala, the amygdala gland. We're talking in the back of your brain, the amygdala. It releases the fight or flight sense inside of you. It releases the stress hormones inside of you and it uses your past experiences, your future expectations and a quick reality check of today to make a decision. So let me break that down again. What's happening? So what's taking place is once you assess the situation, the amygdala is utilizing past experiences. It's utilizing future expectations and it's taking a quick reality of right now to formulate your response. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. So imagine a lion, a big roaring lion. Now, this is important for now and for where we're going later. If you see a lion when you walk outside of your home, what kind of response would you have? I don't know about you, but my response would be like, oh my gosh, I would instantly try to run. Now, why would I run? Because my past experiences and what I've seen on television, because I've, I've, I've seen lions in the wild on television and you've seen what they do. So because of that, you do what? You've seen what they've done in the past. You see how dangerous they have been. Your future expectation. If I don't run, <laughs> I'm going to be toe up, right? I'm going to be eaten. And then the reality of now is this lion is not contained and he is not in a cage. So based on those three factors, I have the mindset to run. Instantly, the amygdala spirit shoots out the pulse. I don't even think for a half a second. I just hightail it and I get back into the house. I lock the door or I get to a place that I feel like it's safe, right? Without even thinking about it. Why? Because the amygdala is shooting those signals from my brain and instantaneously, my body is reacting to those signals. But let's take a look at this. Imagine the same lion you see, but instead of you seeing him when you walk out of your home, you see this lion when you go to the zoo. It's a whole different type of experience because now when you see this lion, you automatically think of this. The past experience is I've been to the zoo before. I've seen lions at the zoo before, and I've never seen anything negative happen because of it. Your future expectation says it's OK for me to get as close to this fence as I want to get because there's no way this lion's going to get this close. And then my reality of now says the lion is behind a cage. He's probably down in a pit. It's probably 20 feet up in the air. And so I feel safe and I feel comfortable. Therefore, my amygdala sends out a signal that is very similar to my everyday signal that I would normally have. Uh, why? Because I feel like that I'm in a situation where there is no danger that is coming close to me or that I feel. See, sometimes we've got to be able to override what our normal senses would say in order for us to get past the fears that the enemy tries to provoke in our life. See, this is a trick that the enemy uses. He knows that if he can provoke fear in your life, he can keep you from receiving that which God wants you to have. Think about this. We are three part beings. We are a spirit that has a soul and a body. And the interesting thing is, is that there's always a battle that's taking place between the spirit and the body 
for the rights of the soul, which is your mentality. Why is that the case? Because I just told you your mentality is what dictates your body and tells your body what to do. It tells your body how to feel. It tells your body where to go. It tells your body how to act and respond. It gives your body the information of whether you're going to have an attitude or not have an attitude, whether you're going to fear or whether you're not going to fear, whether you're going to be happy and walk in joy or you're going to be sad and, uh, and walk in uh, anxiety. All of those things are coming by the way of your mind. So therefore, the spirit is fighting for the rights of your mind. God wants to continuously sow seeds of, of love and peace and joy in you. So therefore, when your body, your natural body starts to see things or starts to try to act towards things in a negative manner, you will remember the things that your spirit has been feeding your mind. So therefore, your mind won't go by the way of what your flesh is seeing. Your mind will go by the way of what it's being fed by the spirit. Whichever one has control over your mind will win the race. Why? Because as soon as your mind starts to process either what it takes from the flesh or either what it takes from the spirit, it will start to act accordingly, whether you really think about it or not. Now, what do you mean? That's because the amygdala will already start to send signals out based on whichever one has the dominant authority in your mind. Even you don't even have to take two seconds to think about it. It will automatically start doing it. So when you look in your Bible, I know we haven't said these scriptures yet, but I want you to go to Second Timothy chapter number um, chapter number one, verse seven. This is a familiar passage of scripture, but I wanted to bring this out to show you the example of exactly what this looks like. Now, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. He says this. He says, for God has not given us, us, plural. This is Paul writing a letter to Timothy. So he's not just saying you, but he's saying us. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, stop right there because this is important. You got to recognize that God did not give us a spirit of fear. That doesn't mean that we will never be fearful. Now, why is that the case? Because sometimes our fear doesn't originate from the spirit. Our fear originates from the flesh, from the body, based on what we see, based on what we feel, based on what we think think could potentially happen based on the imminent danger that we feel like is before us or the evil or the pain that might come our way. That is what instigates and provokes the fear in our minds. So the Bible was clear when he said this, when Paul was speaking, he said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, which means it doesn't derive from the place that God is speaking to us, where God is developing us, where God is growing us, where God is giving us down vital information in order for us to live effectively for the kingdom of God. He doesn't give us that spirit of fear. That's not where it comes from. He says, but I give you what? Power, love, and a sound mind. Now, this is very important to us because we got to recognize that God is not giving us the spirit. So when we go back to verse number three, we're still in Second Timothy chapter number one. Let's go back to verse three. In verse three, he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Why? Because a pure conscience is where the mind is. That's where we process. That's what has control. He says, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night. Verse four, he says, greatly desiring to see you being mindful again in the mind of your tears that you may be filled with joy. So he says, I'm being mindful that you, of your tears that you may be filled with joy. Verse five, when I call to the remembrance of the genuine faith. Now, here's important. Faith is a process of what you believe and what is processed in your mind. Right. That's where it derives from. That's where it starts from. It comes from a thought that you have about your condition and about what is yet to come. That's what faith is. He says it's the substance of things that are hoped for. You hope for things that you've processed in your mind. And now you are believing based on what's up here for the things in which God has said. That's why he comes in verse seven and says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, I want you I want to break this down to you. 
He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is a response that comes from the flesh. He says, but I give you power. So what is that? I give you the authority over fear. Then he says, I give you love. What does that mean? I give you the love that withstands fear. And then he says, and I'll give you a sound mind. That's where fear starts from. So he says, before it even gets started, I'll give you a sound mind. That means a mind that is level. That means a mind that is focused, that is driven, not by the flesh, but by the spirit of God. He says, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. He says, but a power and of love and a sound mind. That means the mind that's connected to Christ in the kingdom that's sound enough to recognize what I've got for you based on what you think is taking place in your life. Now, look at this. I want to go back to this one because there's a scripture in first John. First John chapter number four. In 1 John chapter number 4, verse 17, I want to read you this piece because he says not only power, we get that. We understand that we have the authority over fear, which means we have power. We have power. He says a sound mind. We recognize that that's where fear starts now. So we understand that. But I want us to talk about this love piece. He says I'm giving you power, love, and a sound mind. Now in First John chapter number four, verse 17, the Bible says this. He says, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? He says, oh, this is my wrong scripture. I'm sorry. I was in chapter number four or chapter three. Let me go back. First John chapter four, verse 17. I apologize. He says, love has been perfected. Think about what he's saying here. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have what? Boldness. The perfection of love brings forth a what? Boldness. So that's why when he said, I don't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, because the love that we have in the Father, who is Christ Jesus, brings forth a boldness, a rebuke of fear to us in the day of judgment. He says, because as he is, so are we in this world. Then he says in 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out Fear, because fear involves torment. So he says, perfect love casts out fear. When you have love that's deeply rooted. Now, how is love perfected? Love is not perfected by the love that you have for one another. Love is not perfected based on brotherly love. Love is not ba based on a, a sexual or intimate love. Love is perfected based on an agape love. And so he says here that love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. And so the fear tries to torment you. But the love that you have in Christ recognizes where your help come from and not and does not allow you to be tormented because the love of God that's deep down on the inside of you. So God says, listen, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He says, but of power, because we have authority over fear. He says, of love, because perfect love casts out all fear. And then he says, a sound mind, because that's where fear starts in the first place. Fear does not start with the activities that go on around you. That's just the actions that are trying to provoke your fear. Fear truly starts on the inside of you in the gland in your mind called the amygdala. That's where it starts. So he says, I will settle your mind and I will make it sound to where you do not even consider fear in your life. So these are the three things that fear does. Here are the three things that fear does. Number one, fear destroys your faith. Why does it destroy your faith? Because it says that I cannot do it 
right? If that's what fear does. When I'm afraid to do something, fear says I cannot do it. It destroys your faith. It steals and robs your faith. And it makes you stop what you're doing, no longer moving forward. Because why? Because it stops my faith. Number two, fear hides the love of the father. Why is this? Because we just read that love that has been perfected gives us boldness. And so that's why fear hides the love of the father, because it wants to bring forth depression in your mind and in your body. It wants to send out those stress hormones to you, letting you feel as if you cannot progress forward because of the fear that's in you. It stops you. It prevents you. It halts you. It makes you feel like that God doesn't matter. It makes you feel like that God doesn't love you. It makes you feel like that nobody loves you. It makes you feel like that you're all alone by yourself. It depresses you. And number three, fear revokes your power. It revokes your power. It completely destroys your power. It removes it from you. It takes it from you. And you no longer have authority over anything in your life. Matter of fact, whatever it is that's been derived in your life, that's provided the fear, now has control over you. It has control over you. So what does fear do? It destroys your faith. It hides the love of the father and it revokes your power. It keeps you from moving forward. And now the fear in itself has control over you and it keeps you from getting to the place where God has truly called you to be. So turn with me in the scriptures here because I want to talk a little bit about the story of Caleb and Joshua. Is it all right if I talk about that on tonight? Caleb and Joshua is where I want to go. Now, in Numbers chapter 13, the Bible is clear about what was taking place. Moses was uh, with the children of Israel. God had promised them a land. He said, listen, I'm not just giving you any type of land. He said, I'm giving you a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And based on that, what he did was, is that God told Moses that I need you to send spies out into the land. I need you to check things out. I want you to go and send them out. See all of what I've given you. And so Moses takes one from each of the 12 tribes and he sends them out to spy out the land, to see what's going on, to see what's taking place. Now, when they get there, I want to show you exactly what Moses told them that they needed to look for. So in uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 17, the Bible says this. It says, then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way in the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like. Whether the people who dwell in it are strong or are weak are few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land uh, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. Now, here's the interesting thing about the story. You know this story. Moses sends the 12 out. They saw how awesome the land was. How amazing it was. They saw the fruit. They spied out the land. For 40 days. Now this is very interesting. I want you to know. Because. At this time. The children of Israel was in the desert still. They did not have access. To the types of resources. That the land which God promised them. Had made available to them. So the Bible is clear that they brought back all types of clusters of grapes and pomegranates and all of these types of fruits it was awesome. They were there for 40 days, which tells me 
each one of the 12 that went over the spy out the land was eating good for 40 days. They was eating what we would like to say the fat of the land, the best that the land had to offer. They were eating it. They were spying out the land, but they was eating. They were taking advantage of the resources that the land had blessed them with. I mean, they had grape juice on their mouth. I mean, they had all kinds of pomegranate. I mean, they was eating good. They hadn't had food like this for a long time, probably since they was in Egypt. So they were able to take on the resources of the land. The Bible says that not only did they were in the land for 40 days, they brought back fruit. The fruit was so big and so plentiful that the Bible says that two men had to carry it on poles between themselves, which means that there was more than enough in that the fruit was ripe for the harvest. Just like God said, just what they were looking for. But the Bible says that there was people already in the land. The descendants of Anak, which were large men and women, were in the land. And they were plentiful. So what does the enemy do? Because I believe the best way to stop you is to keep you from getting started. <laughs> I hope somebody got that on tonight. The best way to stop you from getting to your purpose is to keep you from getting started, to keep you from ever believing and depending and walking forward in that which God has called you to do. What do you mean by that? Well, let's take a look at Adam and Eve. The enemy tried to stop them before they even had any children whatsoever. Let's take a look at Moses. The enemy tried to stop Moses when he was born and tried to kill Moses and take his life. Look at what he did for David. David wasn't even invited to the place where the king at the time was going to be selected. And then finally, let's take a look at what they did to Jesus. They tried to take Jesus out as soon as Jesus was born and tried to use the wise men to help give Herod the information to be able to do it. The enemy is cunning and wise. So before you get started, the enemy is already devising a plan to get you. How can I get them to not believe in that which God has told them? Because if I can get them to not believe it and I can get them to have the spirit of fear, then I can keep them from ever even attempting to get where God called them to be. And so that's what he did. And so we read in the Bible, and when we get to Numbers chapter 13, the men come back from their 40-day journey. They come back from spying out the land. They come back from all of what they've seen, the fruit, the land that's flowing with milk and honey, but yet also the people that are in the land that they are fearful of. And no matter how good they ate, no matter how big the fruit was, no matter how desirable it was, no matter even if God told them it was theirs. Let's look at what they said in Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. He says, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel. In the wilderness of Parham, Kadesh, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly Flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land to the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. They came back. They said, listen, we recognize that there's some good stuff there. We recognize that there's a great and amazing fruit there. You can see the fruit that we brought back. But we also want to let you know there's danger in the land. We are fearful. The descendants of Anak are there. They are strong. 
They are fortified. The Jebusites are there. The Amalekites are there. The Amorites are there. The Hittites are there. The Canaanites are there. Everybody's there and everybody's against us. Instantly, the amygdala kicks in and it says fear or flight. Or it says fight or flight. And their amygdala said what? Flight. We are not going to challenge them. We are not going to go there. And they came back with a bad report. They came back with the report of fear, even though it was God's promise to them, even though God said it was theirs. They couldn't believe it because of what they saw. Their fear pushed them to a place where they gave up their rights. What did I tell you before? Fear will destroy your faith. Fear will hide the father's love and fear will revoke your power. God had already given them the power to override whatever was in front of them. God's love towards them had already shown them the way to go in order for them to get the blessing that God had for them. And then guess what? God had emplaced faith in them so they could believe that what he said was theirs. But because of their fear, their natural mind, their natural senses started to spark and send out signals. So what did it do? It destroyed their faith. It hid the father's love and it revoked the power that was already theirs. The devil didn't do it to them. They did it to themselves. The devil just presented the situation. But it was up to them to make the decision. And that's where we get caught up. That's where we get frustrated. That's where things go awry. Because we make the decision to do things based on what we see with the natural eyes. Not based on what God has said. They, their lack of faith destroyed the, their mindset destroyed their faith. They hid the father's love. They, if they love God enough, they will follow his commandments. That's what the word of God says. We've got to love God that says, in spite of how I feel, in spite of the fear that might be in front of me, I'm still going to do what the father tells me to do because I got love for the father. I'm trusting in the father. The Bible says trust in the Lord with all of your heart. All of your heart. He doesn't say some of your heart. He says trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Then he says this and lean not to your own mind. <laughs> lean not to your own understanding your own mind because your mind will send out signals based on what it sees with your natural emotions and God wants you to look past the natural and allow the supernatural spiritual override to come in and dictate to you what your next move should be that's what God wants to do in your life. And so when we start to pay attention to what the world is doing and the natural things that are taking place, we miss what it is God's looking to do in our life. We got to stand firm, immovable, always abounding in the faith. So the interesting thing is, is that they came back. They came back with a bad report. But let me tell you what happened. There were two that came back with a good report. There was two that did not waver and did not fret and did not have fear for what they saw. And so then the Bible says in Numbers chapter 13, verse number 30, he says this. Then Caleb quieted the people because, you know, when people give bad news, there's always a ruckus. People are talking to each other. People are trying to say different things. People are all got all this anxiety built up like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Why would they be saying that? Oh, my God, I can't believe that they're there. Didn't God tell us this was ours? You know, all that all that murmuring, all that complaining starts to happen when somebody gives a bad report. You know how it is at the job when something's supposed to work a certain way. It doesn't work the exact way that you thought it would work. And oh, well, see, there we go. We're going to go right back to the same thing that we did last time. It's going to happen like this. No, 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 no. Caleb quieted the crowd. And the Bible says, he said this, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Now, what is this? What was inside of Caleb that wasn't inside of the others? What was inside of Joshua that wasn't inside of the others? That 
pushed them to a place of belief. It was their faith for who God was. It was their love for what God said. And it was their power that they had been given based on the authority that God had gave to them already in the first place. Why? Because I told you before, it, just to clarify to you one more time, the way that you start to articulate yourself and the way your body starts to react is based on your future expectations, based on your reality of now and based on what your past perspective has been. So when Joshua and Caleb come and they quiet the crowd, they say, listen, my future expectations are based on the faith that God has already placed on the inside of us. My reality of now is the power and the authority that God has already put in our lives. Look at what he's done for us thus far. So therefore, I'm believing God for what he has said. And then what's my perspective of the past? Don't forget the things the former things, the Bible says, and the things of old. Let's turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 43 to finish this thing off. In Isaiah 43, verse 18, he says, do not remember the former things, nor consider even the things of old. He says, behold, I do a new thing. That means you got to have a quick memory. You got to be able to forget the things that happened yesterday. You got to be able to forget the things that happened last week and last month. You got to be able to forget the attempts that you made before. You cannot allow your past to dictate your future. You've got to put aside the things of your past and just believe in what God has said. So he says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He said, behold, I will do a new thing. So in spite of what the old things have been, in spite of the old ways that you have felt, in spite of the old things that you remember, because the children of Israel remember being in Egypt. They remember not having a lot. They remember, you know, going through all the pain and agony that they had to go through. And they didn't want to continue to deal with that. They didn't want to be taken captive again. They didn't want to have to go through the pain and agony of what their forefathers went through. So because of that, he said, don't even think about the former things or the things of old. He said, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. He says, now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? He says, I will make even a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert places. Now, this is important because God says, I need you to believe and have faith in so much on what the future holds. And I need you to so much forget about the past. See, a desert place is a place that doesn't have any water accessible or available to it. God says it doesn't matter how long it's been a desert. It doesn't matter how long there's been no water there. He says, I'm God and my power and authority with your future expectation for what I said will even bring forth up out of the ground a spring in the midst of the desert places he says and i will even make a road in the midst of the wilderness places god can do the impossible things when you don't allow fear to prevent you from moving forward the impossible becomes possible he said, the beast of the field will honor me, the jackals of the ostrich, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They declare my praise. God says, you are his people. He says, he's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of power. Authority, love, that ability to be able to override your depression and a sound mind. Because that's where fear starts. And so God wants to stop it before it gets started. Because fear, just like a tree, grows roots. And when it gets rooted, it's hard to get that tree up. God wants you to see, see him for not where you've been, but see him for where he said you're going. He doesn't want you to see where you are right now, but he wants to recognize the power that you have to go through your now, to get to the place where he's called you to be. So listen, I know God is able. The Bible says to do exceedingly abundantly above all 
that we could possibly ask or think according to the power that works where? On the inside of you. The power is in you. If you let the spirit reign, the power is in you. If you don't let the spirit reign, the fear is in you. See, if you elevate your fear, you minimize your power. If you elevate your power, then you minimize your fear. Think about it. If I'm six foot ten, 200 75 pounds, just full of muscle. I don't have fear when I see a five-year-old child attempt to come against me physically. Why? Because I have an increased amount of power, which means I have a decreased amount of fear. But yet, I can be that same six foot ten. 275 pounds. And if I had a fear of dogs, it could be a 10 pound chihuahua that don't do nothing but bark. But yet it can paralyze me. It can cripple me. It can prevent me from even moving. Because the fear on the inside of me has rose up to a standard past my power. So if my fear ever rises higher than my power and the authority that I see myself connected to by Christ Jesus, by way of the kingdom, it paralyzes me. But when my power rises up, when my authority rises up, when my love for Christ rises up, then guess what? Fear has to take a back seat because I recognize that I've got the capability. I've got the mindset. I've got the authority from God to do whatever it is that God has called me to do. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but God has given you a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. Whose report will you believe? I pray tonight that you will believe the report of the Lord. Come on, let us pray tonight as we get ready to dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before you right now. We're thanking you, we're praising you, we're magnifying your name. We're thanking you for every single person, God, that's on the other end of this lens. Every single one connected to us on the web. Every single one connected to us, God. Every single one that's here on Facebook and that is praying, believing you, God. That's walking without a spirit of fear. That will not have a, fear, a spirit of fear about coronavirus. Not that we won't use wisdom. Not that we won't do the things which we are asked to do to protect ourselves. We're not going to be foolish, God, but we won't walk in fear. We'll protect ourselves, but we're not going to walk in fear. We're going to listen to what you have said. We're going to do what you have said. We are going to allow the spirit of God to work in us like never before. We're going to be the example that we need to be. We're going to pray and believe God and trust in who he is. Lord, that you shall be glorified. God, that you shall get the praise out of our hearts and out of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we're putting away the former things. We thank you, Lord, we're putting away the things of old. We're walking into this new season without restrictions, without being tied down, without being pushed down. But God, we're walking into this new thing. We're allowing you to order our steps, to position us effectively, to walk into our promised land. The land that you've got for us that's flowing with milk and with honey. We all have a promised land. We all have a place that you have prepared for us. God, let us go. Let us go at once, as Caleb said in the scriptures. And let us believe that you've given us everything we need in order for us to be victorious. Right now, in the name of Jesus. 
God, I pray right now, God, that we will not allow fear to destroy our faith. We will not let it hide your love. Because we know that perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love is not the love that we have for one another. Perfect love is not a sensual love. But perfect love is an agape love that comes only from the Father. That's what we pull on tonight, God. That's what we pull on. Because we know without it, God, we're nothing. Without it, we have no chance. But with it, all things are possible to them that believe. And so, God, we become strong on tonight. We become fortified on tonight. And we tell the devil that we will no longer walk in fear. We will no longer allow those emotions that have been pushed out from our amygdala in our brain to keep us from pressing forward. We will use the spiritual override that you provide by way of the kingdom. That you will get all the glory, honor, and praise out of our lives. We will walk in freedom and not fear. And so God, we give you all the honor. We give you all the glory tonight. And we give you all the praise. Let this word be a blessing to everyone that hears it. And we pray that you get the victory in Jesus mighty name amen listen we thank you all for joining us on tonight we hope that you had an amazing time chilling and hanging with us on tonight so from pastor glover and living word and worship ministries we appreciate you make sure you check out our website go to our website go to our donations tab we'd love for you to be able to give us a donation that we can continue to lift up the name of jesus and bring these awesome messages to you Matter of fact, we are still looking at getting our building. And so everything that you give, we would appreciate uh, for you. And we also want to let you know, if you want to connect with us, make sure you head to our YouTube page. On our YouTube page, where you can go to our YouTube page at Living Word and Worship Ministries. That's where you can check out all the videos that we have for you. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, hit the, the, the notification bell. So every time a new video gets loaded, you'll get notification of that video and you'll know where it's at. Again, on our website, lwwministries.org is where you can check out everything that we've got to offer. We've got videos, we've got pictures, and we've got all the stuff that tells you about the ministry and how you can connect. And so if you're excited about that, please go in and check us out. Next week is going to be an awesome week. That's right. July 16th is coming and it's coming quick. We got another rendition of the purpose and power of financial stewardship. That's right. If you want to understand your finances, if you want to understand how to invest, how to save, what the difference is, which one's even the most important, you're going to want to check this time out because we're going to be talking to you about why investing is so important. And I'm going to tell you why investing is even more important than saving. Wow. So you're not going to want to miss that. So please join us on July 16th at 730. We'll be doing the purpose and power of financial stewardship. All right. Our uh, children are going to be meeting this weekend at 1 p.m. So for all the folks that have our kids out there, our kingdom kids, you got the information there on your screen that you can connect with us and make sure that everybody is good to go. And then for everybody else that's out there, we just want to let you know we are no longer uh, coming to you live on our go to meeting for our Wednesday night Bible studies or our Sunday morning services. So make sure you connect with us right here on Facebook or you send people to our website where they can connect and see the live stream as well. Those will be the two places that you can stream and see us live every single Wednesday night and every single Sunday morning because this is how we do it. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us on tonight. We appreciate your passion. We appreciate your prayers. We appreciate your love. We pray that you've been empowered by the kingdom of God on tonight and that God will continue to bless you like never before. And so make sure you are back here bright and early Sunday morning, 1030 is when we get started. So check us out for another powerful message. Be blessed and see you then.